Chapter Thirty Three of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The conference was neither so short nor so conclusive as the lady had designed. The gentleman was not so easily satisfied. He had all the disposition to persevere that Sir Thomas could wish him. He had vanity, which strongly inclined him in the first place to think she did love him, though she might not know it herself, and which, secondly, when constrained at last to admit that she did know her own present feelings, convinced him that he should be able in time to make those feelings what he wished. He was in love, very much in love, and it was a love which, operating on an active, sanguine spirit, of more warmth than delicacy, made her affection appear of greater consequence because it was withheld, and determined him to have the glory, as well as the felicity, of forcing her to love him. He would not despair, he would not desist, he had every well-grounded reason for solid attachment. He knew her to have all the worth that could justify the warmest hopes of lasting happiness with her. Her conduct at this very time, by speaking the disinterestedness and delicacy of her character, qualities which he believed most rare indeed, was of a sort to heighten all his wishes and confirm all his resolutions. He knew not that he had a pre-engaged heart to attack. Of that he had no suspicion. He considered her rather as one who had never thought on the subject enough to be in danger, who had been guarded by youth, a youth of mind as lovely as of person, whose modesty had prevented her from understanding his attentions, and who was still overpowered by the suddenness of addresses so wholly unexpected, and the novelty of a situation which her fancy had never taken into account. Must it not follow, of course, that when he was understood, he should succeed? He believed it fully. Love such as his, in a man like himself, must with perseverance secure a return, and at no great distance, and he had so much delight in the idea of obliging her to love him in a very short time, that her not loving him now was scarcely regretted. A little difficulty to be overcome was no evil to Henry Crawford. He rather derived spirits from it. He had been apt to gain hearts too easily. His situation was new and animating. To Fanny, however, who had known too much opposition all her life to find any charm in it, all this was unintelligible. She found that he did mean to persevere, but how he could, after such language from her as she felt herself obliged to use, was not to be understood. She told him that she did not love him, could not love him, was sure she should never love him, that such a change was quite impossible, that the subject was most painful to her, that she must entreat him never to mention it again, to allow her to leave him at once, and let it be considered as concluded for ever and when farther pressed, had added that in her opinion their dispositions were so totally dissimilar as to make mutual affection incompatible, and that they were unfitted for each other by nature, education, and habit. All this, she had said, and with the earnestness of sincerity, yet this was not enough, for he immediately denied there being anything uncongenial in their characters, or anything unfriendly in their situations, and positively declared, that he would still love, and still hope. Fanny knew her own meaning, but was no judge of her own manner. Her manner was incurably gentle, and she was not aware how much it concealed the sternness of her purpose. Her diffidence, gratitude, and softness made every expression of indifference seem almost an effort of self-denial, seem at least to be giving nearly as much pain to herself as to him. Mr. Crawford was no longer the Mr. Crawford who, as the clandestine, insidious, treacherous admirer of Maria Bertram, had been her abhorrence, whom she had hated to see or to speak to, in whom she could believe no good quality to exist, and whose power, even of being agreeable, she had barely acknowledged. He was now the Mr. Crawford who was addressing herself with ardent, disinterested love whose feelings were apparently become all that was honourable and upright, whose views of happiness were all fixed on a marriage of attachment, who was pouring out his sense of her merits, describing and describing again his affection, proving as far as words could prove it, and in the language, tone, and spirit of a man of talent, too, that he sought her for her gentleness and her goodness, and, to complete the whole, 
He was now the Mr. Crawford who had procured William's promotion. Here was a change, and here were claims which could not but operate. She might have disdained him in all the dignity of angry virtue, in the grounds of Southerton, or the theatre at Mansfield Park, but he approached her now with rights that demanded different treatment. She must be courteous, and she must be compassionate, she must have a sensation of being honoured, and whether thinking of herself or her brother, she must have a strong feeling of gratitude. The effect of the whole was a manner so pitying and agitated, and words intermingled with her refusal so expressive of obligation and concern, that to a temper of vanity and hope like Crawford's, the truth, or at least the strength of her indifference, might well be questionable, and he was not so irrational as Fanny considered him, in the professions of persevering, assiduous and not desponding attachment which closed the interview. It was with reluctance that he suffered her to go, but there was no look of despair in parting to belie his words, or give her hopes of his being less unreasonable than he professed himself. Now she was angry. Some resentment did arise at a perseverance so selfish and ungenerous. Here was again a want of delicacy and regard for others which had formerly so struck and disgusted her. Here was again a something of the same Mr. Crawford whom she had so reprobated before. How evidently was there a gross want of feeling and humanity where his own pleasure was concerned! And, alas, how always known no principle to supply as a duty what the heart was deficient in! Had her own affections been as free as perhaps they ought to have been, he never could have engaged them. So thought Fanny, in good truth and sober sadness, as she sat musing over that too great indulgence and luxury of a fire upstairs, wondering at the past and present, wondering at what was yet to come, and in a nervous agitation which made nothing clear to her but the persuasion of her being never under any circumstances able to love Mr. Crawford, and the felicity of having a fire to sit over and think of it. Sir Thomas was obliged, or obliged himself, to wait till the morrow for a knowledge of what had passed between the young people. He then saw Mr. Crawford, and received his account. The first feeling was disappointment. He had hoped better things, he had thought that an hour's entreaty from a young man like Crawford could not have worked so little change on a gentle-tempered girl like Fanny. But there was speedy comfort in the determined views and sanguine perseverance of the lover, and when, seeing such confidence of success in the principal, Sir Thomas was soon able to depend on it himself. Nothing was omitted, on his side, of civility, compliment, or kindness, that might assist the plan. Mr. Crawford's steadiness was honoured, and Fanny was praised, and the connection was still the most desirable in the world. At Mansfield Park Mr. Crawford would always be welcome. He had only to consult his own judgment and feelings as to the frequency of his visits, at present or in future. In all his niece's family and friends there could be but one opinion, one wish on the subject, the influence of all who loved her must incline one way. Everything was said that could encourage, every encouragement received with grateful joy, and the gentlemen parted the best of friends. Satisfied that the cause was now on a footing the most proper and hopeful, Sir Thomas resolved to abstain from all farther importunity with his niece, and to show no open interference. Upon her disposition he believed kindness might be the best way of working. Entreaty should be from one quarter only. The forbearance of her family on a point, respecting which she could be in no doubt of their wishes, might be their surest means of forwarding it. Accordingly, on this principle, Sir Thomas took the first opportunity of saying to her, with a mild gravity, intended to be overcoming, "'Well, Fanny, I have seen Mr. Crawford again, and learned from him exactly how matters stand between you. He is a most extraordinary young man, and whatever the event, you must feel that you have created an attachment of no common character.' though young as you are and little acquainted with the transient varying unsteady nature of love as it generally exists you cannot be struck as i am with all that is wonderful in a perseverance of this sort against discouragement with him it is entirely a matter of feeling he claims no merit in it perhaps is entitled to none yet having chosen so well his constancy has a respectable stamp had his choice been less unexceptionable, I should have condemned his persevering. 
"'Indeed, sir,' said Fanny, "'I am very sorry that Mr. Crawford should continue to know that it is paying me a very great compliment, and I feel most undeservedly honoured. But I am so perfectly convinced, and I have told him so, that it never will be in my power—' "'My dear,' interrupted Sir Thomas, "'there is no occasion for this. Your feelings are as well known to me as my wishes and regrets must be to you. There is nothing more to be said or done. From this hour the subject is never to be revived between us. You will have nothing to fear or to be agitated about. You cannot suppose me capable of trying to persuade you to marry against your inclinations. Your happiness and advantage are all that I have in view, and nothing is required of you but to bear with Mr. Crawford's endeavours to convince you that they may not be incompatible with his. He proceeds at his own risk. You are on safe ground. I have engaged for your seeing him whenever he calls, as you might have done had nothing of this sort occurred. You will see him with the rest of us, in the same manner, and, as much as you can, dismissing the recollection of everything unpleasant. He leaves Northamptonshire so soon that even this slight sacrifice cannot be often demanded. The future must be very uncertain. And now, my dear Fanny, this subject is closed between us. The promised departure was all that Fanny could think of with much satisfaction. Her uncle's kind expressions, however, and forbearing manner, were sensibly felt, and when she considered how much of the truth was unknown to him, she believed she had no right to wonder at the line of conduct he pursued. He, who had married a daughter to Mr. Rushworth, romantic delicacy was certainly not to be expected from him. She must do her duty, and trust that time might make her duty easier than it now was. She could not, though only eighteen, suppose Mr. Crawford's attachment would hold out for ever. She could not but imagine that steady, unceasing discouragement from herself would put an end to it in time. How much she might, in her own fancy, allot for its dominion, is another concern. It would not be fair to inquire into a young lady's exact estimate of her own perfections. In spite of his intended silence, Sir Thomas found himself once more obliged to mention the subject to his niece, to prepare her briefly for its being imparted to her aunts a measure which he still would have avoided, if possible, but which became necessary from the totally opposite feelings of Mr. Crawford as to any secrecy of proceeding. He had no idea of concealment. It was all known at the parsonage, where he loved to talk over the future with both his sisters, and it would be rather gratifying to him to have enlightened witnesses of the progress of his success. When Sir Thomas understood this, he felt the necessity of making his own wife and sister-in-law acquainted with the business without delay. Though, on Fanny's account, he almost dreaded the effect of the communication to Mrs. Norris as much as Fanny herself. He deprecated her mistaken but well-meaning zeal. Sir Thomas, indeed, was by this time not very far from classing Mrs. Norris as one of those well-meaning people who are always doing mistaken and very disagreeable things. Mrs. Norris, however, relieved him. He pressed for the strictest forbearance and silence towards their niece. She not only promised, but did observe it. She only looked her increased ill-will. Angry she was, bitterly angry, but she was more angry with Fanny for having received such an offer than for refusing it. It was an injury and affront to Julia, who ought to have been Mr. Crawford's choice, and independently of that she disliked Fanny because she had neglected her, and she would have grudged such an elevation to one whom she had always been trying to depress. Sir Thomas gave her more credit for discretion on the occasion than she deserved, and Fanny could have blessed her for allowing her only to see her displeasure, and not to hear it. Lady Bertram took it differently. She had been a beauty, and a prosperous beauty, all her life, and beauty and wealth were all that excited her respect. To know Fanny to be sought in marriage by a man of fortune raised her, therefore, very much in her opinion. By convincing her that Fanny was very pretty, which she had been doubting about before, and that she would be advantageously married, it made her feel a sort of a credit in calling her niece. "'Well, Fanny,' said she, as soon as they were alone together afterwards, and she really had known something like impatience to be alone with her, and her countenance, as she spoke, had extraordinary animation. 
Well, Fanny, I have had a very agreeable surprise this morning. I must just speak of it once. I told Sir Thomas I must once, and then I shall have done. I give you joy, my dear niece. And looking at her complacently, she added, Hm, we certainly are a handsome family. Fanny coloured and doubted at first what to say, when hoping to assail her on her vulnerable side, she presently answered, My dear aunt, you cannot wish me to do differently from what I have done, I am sure. You cannot wish me to marry, for you would miss me, should not you? Yes, I am sure you would miss me too much for that. No, my dear, I should not think of missing you in such an offer as this comes in your way. I could do very well without you, if you were married to a man of such good estate as Mr. Crawford. And you must be aware, Fanny, that it is every young woman's duty to accept such a very unexceptionable offer as this. This was almost the only rule of conduct, the only piece of advice which Fanny had ever received from her aunt in the course of eight years and a half. It silenced her. She felt how unprofitable contention would be. If her aunt's feelings were against her, nothing could be hoped from attacking her understanding. Lady Bertram was quite talkative. "'I will tell you what, Fanny,' said she, "'I am sure he fell in love with you at the ball. I am sure the mischief was done that evening. You did look remarkably well. Everybody said so. Sir Thomas said so, and you know you had Chapman to help you to dress.' I am very glad I sent Chapman to you. I shall tell Sir Thomas that I am sure it was done that evening." And still pursuing the same cheerful thoughts, she soon afterwards added, "'And will tell you what, Fanny, which is more than I did for Maria. The next time Pug has a litter, you shall have a puppy.'" End of chapter 33《Mansfield Park》by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Edmund had great things to hear on his return. Many surprises were awaiting him. The first that occurred was not least in interest, the appearance of Henry Crawford and his sister walking together through the village as he rode into it. He had concluded he had meant them to be far distant. His absence had been extended beyond a fortnight purposely to avoid Miss Crawford. He was returning to Mansfield with spirits ready to feed on melancholy remembrances and tender associations, and when her own fair self was before him, leaning on her brother's arm, and he found himself receiving a welcome, unquestionably friendly, from the woman whom, two moments before, he had been thinking of as seventy miles off and as farther, much farther from him in inclination than any distance could express. Her reception of him was of a sort which he could not have hoped for, had he expected to see her. Coming as he did from such a purport fulfilled as had taken him away, he would have expected anything rather than a look of satisfaction, and words of simple pleasant meaning. It was enough to set his heart in a glow, and to bring him home in the properest state for feeling the full value of the other joyful surprises at hand. William's promotion, with all its particulars, he was soon master of, and with such a secret provision of comfort within his own breast to help the joy, he found in it a source of most gratifying sensation and unvarying cheerfulness all dinner-time. After dinner, when he and his father were alone, he had Fanny's history, and then all the great events of the last fortnight and the present situation of matters at Mansfield were known to him. Fanny suspected what was going on. They sat so much longer than usual in the dining-parlour that she was sure they must be talking of her, and when tea at last brought them away, and she was to be seen by Edmund again, she felt dreadfully guilty. He came to her, sat down by her, took her hand and pressed it kindly, and at that moment she thought that, but for the occupation and the scene which the tea-things afforded, she must have betrayed her emotion in some unpardonable excess. He was not intending, however, by such action to be conveying to her that unqualified approbation and encouragement which her hopes drew from it. It was designed only to express his participation in all that interested her, and to tell her that he had been hearing what quickened every feeling of affection. 
He was, in fact, entirely on his father's side of the question. His surprise was not so great as his father's at her refusing Crawford, because, so far from supposing her to consider him with anything like a preference, he had always believed it to be rather the reverse, and could imagine her to be taken perfectly unprepared. But Sir Thomas could not regard the connection as more desirable than he did. It had every recommendation to him, and while honouring her for what she had done under the influence of her present indifference, honouring her in rather stronger terms than Sir Thomas could quite echo, he was most earnest in hoping, and sanguine in believing, that it would be a match at last, and that, united by mutual affection, it would appear that their dispositions were as exactly fitted to make them blessed in each other as he was now beginning seriously to consider them. Crawford had been too precipitate. He had not given her time to attach herself. He had begun at the wrong end. With such powers as his, however, and such a disposition as hers, Edmund trusted that everything would work out a happy conclusion. Meanwhile he saw enough of Fanny's embarrassment to make him scrupulously guard against exciting it a second time by any word or look or movement. Crawford called the next day, and on the score of Edmund's return Sir Thomas felt himself more than licensed to ask him to stay to dinner. It was really a necessary compliment. He stayed, of course, and Edmund had then ample opportunity for observing how he sped with Fanny, and what degree of immediate encouragement for him might be extracted from her manners. And it was so little, so very, very little, every chance, every possibility of it resting upon her embarrassment only. If there was not hope in her confusion, there was hope in nothing else. That he was almost ready to wonder at his friend's perseverance. Fanny was worth it all. He held her to be worth every effort of patience, every exertion of mind, but he did not think he could have gone on himself with any woman breathing, without something more to warm his courage than his eyes could discern in hers. He was very willing to hope that Crawford saw clearer, and this was the most comfortable conclusion for his friend that he could come to from all he observed to pass before, and at, and after dinner. In the evening a few circumstances occurred which he thought more promising. When he and Crawford walked into the drawing-room, his mother and Fanny were sitting as intently and silently at work as if there were nothing else to care for. Edmund could not help noticing their apparently deep tranquillity. "'We have not been so silent all the time,' replied his mother. "'Fanny has been reading to me, and only put the book down upon hearing you coming.' And sure enough there was a book on the table which had the air of being very recently closed, a volume of Shakespeare. "'She often reads to me out of those books, and she was in the middle of a very fine speech of that man's. What's his name, Fanny? When we heard your footsteps?' Crawford took the volume. "'Let me have the pleasure of finishing that speech to your ladyship,' said he. "'I shall find it immediately.' And by carefully giving way to the inclination of the leaves, he did find it, or within a page or two, quite near enough to satisfy Lady Bertram, who assured him, as soon as he mentioned the name of Cardinal Wolsey, that he had got the very speech. Not a look or an offer of help had Fanny given, not a syllable for or against. All her attention was for her work. She seemed determined to be interested by nothing else. But taste was too strong in her. She could not abstract her mind five minutes. She was forced to listen. His reading was capital, and her pleasure in good reading extreme. To good reading, however, she had been long used. Her uncle read well, her cousins all, Edmund very well. But in Mr. Crawford's reading there was a variety of excellence beyond what she had ever met with. The King, the Queen, Buckingham, Wolsey, Cromwell, all were given in turn, for with the happiest knack, the happiest power of jumping and guessing, he could always alight at will on the best scene, or the best speeches of each, and whether it were dignity, or pride, or tenderness, or remorse, or whatever were to be expressed, he could do it with equal beauty. It was truly dramatic. His acting had at first taught Fanny what pleasure a play might give, and his reading brought all his acting before her again nay, perhaps with greater enjoyment, for it came unexpectedly, and with no such drawback as she had been used to suffer in seeing him on the stage with Miss Bertram. Edmund watched the gradual progress of her attention, and was amused and gratified by seeing how she gradually slackened in the needlework, which at the beginning seemed to occupy her totally, how it fell from her hand while she sat motionless over it, and at last, how the eyes which had appeared so studiously to avoid him throughout the day were turned and fixed on Crawford, 
fixed on him for minutes, fixed on him, in short, till the attraction drew Crawford's upon her, and the book was closed, and the charm broken. Then she was shrinking again into herself, and blushing and working as hard as ever, but it had been enough to give Edmund encouragement for his friend, and as he cordially thanked him, he hoped to be expressing Fanny's secret feelings, too. "'That play must be a favourite with you,' said he. "'You read as if you knew it well.' "'It will be a favourite, I believe, from this hour,' replied Crawford. "'But I do not think I have had a volume of Shakespeare in my hand before since I was fifteen. I once saw Henry the Eighth acted, or I have heard of it from somebody who did, I am not certain which, but Shakespeare one gets acquainted with without knowing how. It is a part of an Englishman's constitution. His thoughts and beauties are so spread abroad that one touches them everywhere. One is intimate with him by instinct. No man of any brain can open a good part of one of his plays without falling into the flow of his meaning immediately. No doubt one is familiar with Shakespeare in a degree, said Edmund. From one's earliest years. His celebrated passages are quoted by everybody. They are in half the books we open, and we all talk Shakespeare, use his similes, and describe with his descriptions. But this is totally distinct from giving his sense as you gave it. To know him in bits and scraps is common enough. To know him pretty thoroughly is perhaps not uncommon, but to read him well aloud is no everyday talent. Sir, you do me honour, was Crawford's answer with a bow of mock gravity. Both gentlemen had a glance at Fanny, to see if a word of accordant praise could be extorted from her, yet both feeling that it could not be. Her praise had been given in her attention. That must content them. Lady Bertram's admiration was expressed, and strongly too. "'It was really like being at a play,' said she. "'I wish Sir Thomas had been here.' Crawford was excessively pleased. If Lady Bertram, with all her incompetency and languor, could feel this, the interference of what her niece, alive and enlightened as she was, must feel, was elevating. "'You have a great turn for acting, I am sure, Mr. Crawford,' said her ladyship soon afterwards. "'And I will tell you what. I think you will have a theatre, some time or other, at your house in Norfolk. I mean, when you are settled there. I do indeed.' I think you will fit up a theatre at your house in Norfolk. Do you, ma'am? cried he, with quickness. No, no, that will never be. Your ladyship is quite mistaken. No theatre at Everingham. Oh, no. And he looked at Fanny with an expressive smile, which evidently meant— That lady will never allow a theatre at Everingham. Edmund saw it all, and saw Fanny so determined not to see it, as to make it clear that the voice was enough to convey the full meaning of the protestation, and such a quick consciousness of compliment, such a ready comprehension of a hint, he thought, was rather favourable than not. The subject of reading aloud was farther discussed. The two young men were the only talkers, but they, standing by the fire, talked over the too common neglect of the qualification, the total inattention to it, in the ordinary school system for boys, the consequently natural— yet in some instances almost unnatural, degree of ignorance and uncouthness of men, of sensible and well-informed men, when suddenly called to the necessity of reading aloud, which had fallen within their notice, giving instances of blunders, and failures with their secondary causes, the want of management of the voice, of proper modulation and emphasis, of foresight and judgment, all proceeding from the first cause, want of early attention and habit, and Fanny was listening again with great entertainment. "'Even in my profession,' said Edmund, with a smile, "'how little the art of reading has been studied, how little a clear manner and good delivery have been attended to. I speak rather of the past, however, than the present. There is now a spirit of improvement abroad. But among those who were ordained twenty, thirty, forty years ago, the larger number, to judge by their performance, must have thought reading was reading and preaching was preaching. It is different now. The subject is more justly considered. It is felt that distinctness and energy may have weight in recommending the most solid truths. And besides, there is more general observation and taste, a more critical knowledge diffused than formerly. In every congregation there is a larger proportion who know a little of the matter, and who can judge and criticise. Edmund had already gone through the service once since his ordination, 
and upon this being understood he had a variety of questions from Crawford as to his feelings and success, questions which being made, though with the vivacity of friendly interest and quick taste, without any touch of that spirit of banter or air of levity which Edmund knew to be most offensive to Fanny, he had true pleasure in satisfying, and when Crawford proceeded to ask his opinion and give his own as to the properest manner in which particular passages in the service should be delivered, showing it to be a subject on which he had thought before, and thought with judgment, Edmund was still more and more pleased. This would be the way to Fanny's heart. She was not to be won by all that gallantry and wit and good nature together could do, or at least she would not be won by them nearly so soon, without the assistance of sentiment and feeling, and seriousness on serious subjects. "'Our liturgy,' observed Crawford, "'has beauties which not even a careless, slovenly style of reading can destroy. But it has also redundancies and repetitions which require good reading not to be felt. For myself, at least, I must confess not being always so attentive as I ought to be.' Here was a glance at Fanny. "'That nineteen times out of twenty I am thinking how such a prayer ought to be read, and longing to have it to read myself. Did you speak?' Stepping eagerly to Fanny, and addressing her in a softened voice, and upon her saying, "'No,' he added, "'Are you sure you did not speak? I saw your lips move. I fancied you might be going to tell me I ought to be more attentive, and not allow my thoughts to wander. Are not you going to tell me so?' No, indeed, you know your duty too well for me to—even supposing—' She stopped, felt herself getting into a puzzle, and could not be prevailed on to add another word, not by dint of several minutes of supplication and waiting. He then returned to his former station, and went on as if there had been no such tender interruption. "'A sermon, well delivered, is more uncommon even than prayers well read. A sermon, good in itself, is no rare thing.' It is more difficult to speak well than to compose well, that is, the rules and trick of composition are oftener a subject of study. A thoroughly good sermon, thoroughly well delivered, is a capital gratification. I can never hear such a one without the greatest admiration and respect, and more than half a mind to take orders and preach myself. There is something in the eloquence of the pulpit, when it is really eloquence, which is entitled to the highest praise and honour. The preacher who can touch and affect such a heterogeneous mass of hearers, on subjects limited and long-worn threadbare in all common hands, who can say anything new or striking, anything that rouses the attention without offending the taste, or wearing out the feelings of his hearers, is a man whom one could not, in his public capacity, honour enough. I should like to be such a man. Edmund laughed. I should indeed. I never listened to a distinguished preacher in my life without a sort of envy. But then I must have a London audience. I could not preach but to the educated, to those who were capable of estimating my composition. And I do not know that I should be fond of preaching often, now and then, perhaps once or twice in the spring, after being anxiously expected for half a dozen Sundays together, but not for a constancy. It would not do for a constancy." Here Fanny, who could not but listen, involuntarily shook her head, and Crawford was instantly by her side again, entreating to know her meaning. And as Edmund perceived, by his drawing in a chair and sitting down close by her, that it was to be a very thorough attack, that looks and undertones were to be well tried, he sank as quietly as possible into a corner, turned his back and took up a newspaper, very sincerely wishing that dear little Fanny might be persuaded into explaining away that shake of the head to the satisfaction of her ardent lover, and as earnestly trying to bury every sound of the business from himself in murmurs of his own, over the various advertisements of a most desirable estate in South Wales, to parents and guardians, and a capital seasoned hunter. Fanny, meanwhile, vexed with herself for not having been as motionless as she was speechless, and grieved to the heart to see Edmund's arrangements, was trying by everything in the power of her modest, gentle nature to repulse Mr. Crawford, and avoid both his looks and inquiries, and he, unrepulsable, was persisting in both. "'What did that shake of the head mean?' said he. "'What was it meant to express? Disapprobation, I fear, but of what?' What had I been saying to displease you? Did you think me speaking improperly, lightly, irreverently on the subject? 
Only tell me if I was, only tell me if I was wrong. I want to be set right. Nay, nay, I entreat you, for one moment put down your work. What did that shake of the head mean? In vain was her. Pray, sir, don't. Pray, Mr. Crawford. Repeated twice over, and in vain did she try to move away. In the same low, eager voice, and the same close neighbourhood, he went on, re-urging the same questions as before. She grew more agitated and displeased. "'How can you, sir? You quite astonish me. I wonder how you can—' "'Do I astonish you?' said he. "'Do you wonder? Is there anything in my present entreaty that you do not understand? I will explain to you instantly all that makes me urge you in this manner, all that gives me an interest in what you look and do, and excites my present curiosity. I will not leave you to wonder long.' In spite of herself she could not help half a smile but she said nothing. You shook your head at my acknowledging that I should not like to engage in the duties of a clergyman always for a constancy. Yes, that was the word, constancy. I am not afraid of the word. I would spell it, read it, write it with anybody. I see nothing alarming in the word. Did you think I ought? Perhaps, sir, said Fanny, wearied at last into speaking. Perhaps, sir, I thought it was a pity you did not always know yourself as well as you seemed to do at that moment." Crawford, delighted to get her to speak at any rate, was determined to keep it up, and poor Fanny, who had hoped to silence him by such an extremity of reproof, found herself sadly mistaken, and that it was only a change from one object of curiosity and one set of words to another. He had always something to entreat the explanation of. The opportunity was too fair. None such had occurred since his seeing her in her uncle's room, none such might occur again before his leaving Mansfield. Lady Bertram's being just on the other side of the table was a trifle, for she might always be considered as only half awake, and Edmund's advertisements were still of the first utility. Well? said Crawford, after a course of rapid questions and reluctant answers. I am happier than I was, because I now understand more clearly your opinion of me. You think me unsteady, easily swayed by the whim of the moment, easily tempted, easily put aside. With such an opinion, no wonder that. But we shall see. It is not by protestations that I shall endeavour to convince you I am wronged. It is not by telling you that my affections are steady. My conduct shall speak for me. Absence, distance, time shall speak for me. They shall prove that, as far as you can be deserved by anybody, I do deserve you. You are infinitely my superior in merit, and that I know. You have qualities which I had not before supposed to exist in such a degree in any human creature. You have some touches of the angel in you beyond what, not merely beyond what one sees, because one never sees anything like it, but beyond what one fancies might be. But still I am not frightened. It is not by a quality of merit that you can be won. That is out of the question. It is he who sees and worships your merit the strongest, who loves you most devotedly, that has the best right to a return. There I build my confidence. By that right I do and will deserve you, and when once convinced that my attachment is what I declare it, I know you too well not to entertain the warmest hopes. Yes, dearest, sweetest Fanny, nay." seeing her draw back, displeased. Forgive me, perhaps I have as yet no right. But by what other name can I call you? Do you suppose you are ever present in my imagination under any other? No, it is Fanny that I think of all day, and dream of all night. You have given the name such reality of sweetness that nothing else can now be descriptive of you. Fanny could hardly have kept her seat any longer, or have refrained from at least trying to get away in spite of all the too public opposition she foresaw to it, had it not been for the sound of approaching relief, the very sound which she had been long watching for, and long thinking strangely delayed. The solemn procession, headed by Badley, of tea-board, urn, and cake-bearers, made its appearance, and delivered her from a grievous imprisonment of body and mind. Mr. Crawford was obliged to move. She was at liberty, she was busy, she was well protected. Edmund was not sorry to be admitted again among the number of those who might speak and hear. But though the conference had seemed full long to him, and though on looking at Fanny he saw rather a flush of vexation, he inclined to hope that so much could not have been said and listened to without some profit to the speaker. End of chapter 34 
of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Edmund had determined that it belonged entirely to Fanny to choose whether her situation with regard to Crawford should be mentioned between them or not, and that if she did not lead the way, it should never be touched on by him. But after a day or two of mutual reserve, he was induced by his father to change his mind, and try what his influence might do for his friend. A day, and a very early day, was actually fixed for the Crawfords' departure, and Sir Thomas thought it might be as well to make one more effort for the young man before he left Mansfield, that all his professions and vows of unshaken attachment might have as much hope to sustain them as possible. Sir Thomas was most cordially anxious for the perfection of Mr. Crawford's character in that point. He wished him to be a model of constancy, and fancied the best means of effecting it would be by not trying him too long. Edmund was not unwilling to be persuaded to engage in the business. He wanted to know Fanny's feelings. She had been used to consult him in every difficulty, and he loved her too well to bear to be denied her confidence now. He hoped to be of service to her. He thought he must be of service to her. Whom else had she to open her heart to? If she did not need counsel, she must need the comfort of communication. Fanny estranged from him, silent and reserved, was an unnatural state of things, a state which he must break through, and which he could easily learn to think she was wanting him to break through. "'I will speak to her, sir. I will take the first opportunity of speaking to her alone,' was the result of such thoughts as these, and upon Sir Thomas's information of her being at that very time walking alone in the shrubbery, he instantly joined her. "'I am come to walk with you, Fanny,' said he. "'Shall I?' drawing her arm within his. "'It is a long while since we have had a comfortable walk together.' She assented to it all rather by look than word. Her spirits were low. "'But, Fanny,' he presently added, "'in order to have a comfortable walk, something more is necessary than merely pacing this gravel together. You must talk to me. I know you have something on your mind. I know what you are thinking of. You cannot suppose me uninformed.' Am I to hear of it from everybody but Fanny herself?" Fanny, at once agitated and dejected, replied, "'If you hear of it from everybody, cousin, there can be nothing for me to tell.' "'Not of facts, perhaps, but of feelings, Fanny. No one but you can tell me them. I do not mean to press you, however. If it is not what you wish yourself, I have done. I had thought it might be a relief. I am afraid we think too differently for me to find any relief in talking of what I feel. Do you suppose that we think differently? I have no idea of it. I dare say that on a comparison of our opinions they would be found as much alike as they have been used to be. To the point, I consider Crawford's proposals as most advantageous and desirable if you could return his affection. I consider it as most natural that all your family should wish you could return it but that as you cannot you have done exactly as you ought in refusing him can there be any disagreement between us here oh no but i thought you blamed me i thought you were against me this is such a comfort this comfort you might have had sooner fanny had you sought it but how could you possibly suppose me against you how could you imagine me an advocate for marriage without love were I even careless in general on such matters, how could you imagine me so where your happiness was at stake? My uncle thought me wrong, and I knew he had been talking to you. As far as you have gone, Fanny, I think you perfectly right. I may be sorry, I may be surprised, though hardly that, for you had not had time to attach yourself. But I think you perfectly right. Can it admit of a question? It is disgraceful to us if it does. You did not love him. Nothing could have justified your accepting him." Fanny had not felt so comfortable for days and days. "'So far your conduct has been faultless, and they were quite mistaken who wished you to do otherwise. But the matter does not end here. Crawford's is no common attachment. He perseveres with the hope of creating that regard which had not been created before. This, we know, must be a work of time. But with an affectionate smile. Let him succeed at last, Fanny. Let him succeed at last. You have proved yourself upright and disinterested. 
prove yourself grateful and tender-hearted and then you will be the perfect model of a woman which i have always believed you born for oh never 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 he never will succeed with me and she spoke with a warmth which quite astonished edmund and which she blushed at the recollection of herself when she saw his look and heard him reply never fanny so very determined and positive this is not like yourself your rational self i mean she cried sorrowfully correcting herself that i think i never shall as far as the future can be answered for i think i never shall return his regard i must hope better things i am aware more aware than crawford can be that the man who means to make you love him you having due notice of his intentions must have very uphill work for there are all your early attachments and habits in battle array and before he can get your heart for his own use he has to unfasten it from all the holds upon things animate and inanimate which so many years growth have confirmed and which are considerably tightened for the moment by the very idea of separation i know that the apprehension of being forced to quit mansfield will for a time be arming you against him i wish he had not been obliged to tell you what he was trying for i wish he had known you as well as i do fanny between us i think we should have won you my theoretical and his practical knowledge together could not have failed he should have worked upon my plans i must hope however that time proving him as i firmly believe it will to deserve you by his steady affection will give him his reward i cannot suppose that you have not the wish to love him the natural wish of gratitude you must have some feeling of that sort you must be sorry for your own indifference we are so totally unlike said fanny avoiding a direct answer we are so very very different in all our inclinations and ways that i consider it as quite impossible we should ever be tolerably happy together even if i could like him there never were two people more dissimilar we have not one taste in common we should be miserable you are mistaken fanny the dissimilarity is not so strong you are quite enough alike you have tastes in common you have moral and literary tastes in common you have both warm hearts and benevolent feelings and fanny who that heard him read and saw you listen to shakespeare the other night will think you unfitted as companions you forget yourself there is a decided difference in your tempers i allow he is lively you are serious but so much the better his spirits will support yours it is your disposition to be easily dejected and to fancy difficulties greater than they are his cheerfulness will counteract this he sees difficulties nowhere and his pleasantness and gaiety will be a constant support to you your being so far unlike fanny does not in the smallest degree make against the probability of your happiness together do not imagine it i am myself convinced that it is rather a favourable circumstance i am perfectly persuaded that the tempest had better be unlike i mean unlike in the flow of the spirits in the manners in the inclination for much or little company in the propensity to talk or to be silent to be grave or to be gay some opposition here is i am thoroughly convinced friendly to matrimonial happiness i exclude extremes of course and a very close resemblance in all these points would be the likeliest way to produce an extreme a counteraction gentle and continual is the best safeguard of manners and conduct full well could fanny guess where his thoughts were now miss crawford's power was all returning he had been speaking of her cheerfully from the hour of his coming home his avoiding her was quite at an end. He had dined at the parsonage only the preceding day. After leaving him to his happier thoughts for some minutes, Fanny, feeling it due to herself, returned to Mr. Crawford and said, "'It is not merely in temper that I consider him as totally unsuited to myself, though in that respect I think the difference between us too great, infinitely too great. His spirits often oppress me, but there is something in him which I object to still more. I must say, cousin, that I cannot approve his character. I have not thought well of him from the time of the play. 
I then saw him behaving, as it appeared to me, so very improperly and unfeelingly, I may speak of it now because it is all over, so improperly by poor Mr. Rushworth, not seeming to care how he exposed or hurt him, and paying attentions to my cousin Maria, which, in short, at the time of the play, I received an impression which will never be got over. "'My dear Fanny,' replied Edmund, scarcely hearing her to the end, "'let us not, any of us, be judged by what we appeared at that time of general folly. The time of the play is a time which I hate to recollect. Maria was wrong, Crawford was wrong, we were all wrong together, but none so wrong as myself. Compared with me, all the rest were blameless. I was playing the fool with my eyes open. As a bystander, said Fanny, perhaps I saw more than you did, and I do think that Mr. Rushworth was sometimes very jealous. Very possibly. No wonder. Nothing could be more improper than the whole business. I am shocked whenever I think that Maria could be capable of it. But if she could undertake the part, we must not be surprised at the rest. Before the play, I am much mistaken if Julia did not think he was paying her attentions. Julia! I have heard before from some one of his being in love with Julia, but I could never see anything of it. And Fanny, though I hope I do justice to my sister's good qualities, I think it very possible that they might, one or both, be more desirous of being admired by Crawford, and might show that desire rather more unguardedly than was perfectly prudent. I can remember that they were evidently fond of his society, and with such encouragement a man like Crawford, lively, and it may be a little unthinking, might be led on to— There could be nothing very striking, because it is clear that he had no pretensions. His heart was reserved for you, and I must say that its being for you has raised him inconceivably, in my opinion. It does him the highest honour. It shows his proper estimation of the— blessing of domestic happiness and pure attachment. It proves him unspoilt by his uncle. It proves him, in short, everything that I had been used to wish to believe him, and feared he was not. I am persuaded that he does not think as he ought on serious subjects. Say rather that he has not thought at all upon serious subjects, which I believe to be a good deal the case. How could it be otherwise with such an education and adviser? Under the disadvantages, indeed, which both have had, is it not wonderful that they should be what they are? Crawford's feelings, I am ready to acknowledge, have hitherto been too much his guides. Happily, these feelings have generally been good. You will supply the rest, and a most fortunate man he is to attach himself to such a creature, to a woman who, firm as a rock in her own principles, has a gentleness of character so well adapted to recommend them. He has chosen his partner indeed with a rare felicity. He will make you happy, Fanny, I know he will make you happy. But you will make him everything. I would not engage in such a charge, cried Fanny in a shrinking accent. In such an office of high responsibility. As usual, believing yourself unequal to anything. Fancying everything too much for you. Well, though I may not be able to persuade you into different feelings, you will be persuaded into them, I trust. I confess myself sincerely anxious that you may. I have no common interest in Crawford's well-doing. Next to your happiness, Fanny, his has the first claim on me. You are aware of my having no common interest in Crawford. Fanny was too well aware of it to have anything to say, and they walked on together some fifty yards in mutual silence and abstraction. Edmund first began again. I was very much pleased by her manner of speaking of it yesterday, particularly pleased because I had not depended upon her seeing everything in so just a light. I knew she was very fond of you, but yet I was afraid of her not estimating your worth to her brother quite as it deserved, and of her regretting that he had not rather fixed on some woman of distinction or fortune. I was afraid of the bias of those worldly maxims which she has been too much used to hear. But it was very different. She spoke of you, Fanny, just as she ought. She desires the connection as warmly as your uncle or myself. We had a long talk about it. I should not have mentioned the subject, though very anxious to know her sentiments. 
but i had not been in the room five minutes before she began introducing it with all that openness of heart and sweet peculiarity of manner that spirit and ingenuousness which are so much a part of herself mrs grant laughed at her for the rapidity was mrs grant in the room then yes when i reached the house i found the two sisters together by themselves and when once we had begun we had not done with you fanny till crawford and dr grant came in it is above a week since i saw miss crawford yes she laments it yet owns it may have been best you will see her however before she goes she is very angry with you fanny you must be prepared for that she calls herself very angry but you can imagine her anger it is the regret and disappointment of a sister who thinks her brother has a right to everything he may wish for at the first moment she is hurt as you would be for william but she loves and esteems you with all her heart i knew she would be very angry with me my dearest fanny cried edmund pressing her arm closer to him do not let the idea of her anger distress you it is anger to be talked of rather than felt her heart is made for love and kindness not for resentment i wish you could have overheard her tribute of praise i wish you could have seen her countenance when she said that you should be henry's wife and i observed that she always spoke of you as fanny which she was never used to do and it had a sound of most sisterly cordiality and mrs grant did she speak was she there all the time yes she was agreeing exactly with her sister the surprise of your refusal fanny seems to have been unbounded that you could refuse such a man as henry crawford seems more than they can understand i said what i could for you but in good truth as they stated the case you must prove yourself to be in your senses as soon as you can by a different conduct nothing else will satisfy them but this is teasing you i have done do not turn away from me i should have thought said fanny after a pause of recollection and exertion that every woman must have felt the possibility of a man's not being approved not being loved by some one of her sex at least let him be ever so generally agreeable let him have all the perfections in the world i think it ought not to be set down as certain that a man must be acceptable to every woman he may happen to like himself but even supposing it is so allowing mr crawford to have all the claims which his sisters think he has how was i to be prepared to meet him with any feeling answerable to his own he took me wholly by surprise i had not an idea that his behaviour to me before had any meaning and surely i was not to be teaching myself to like him only because he was taking what seemed very idle notice of me in my situation it would have been the extreme of vanity to be forming expectations on mr crawford i am sure his sisters rating him as they do must have thought it so supposing he had meant nothing how then was i to be to be in love with him the moment he said he was with me how was i to have an attachment at his service as soon as it was asked for his sister should consider me as well as him the higher his deserts the more improper for me ever to have thought of him and and we think very differently of the nature of women if they can imagine a woman so very soon capable of returning an affection as this seems to imply my dear dear fanny now i have the truth i know this to be the truth and most worthy of you are such feelings i had attributed them to you before i thought i could understand you you have now given exactly the explanation which i ventured to make for you to your friend and mrs grant and they were both better satisfied though your warm-hearted friend was still run away with a little by the enthusiasm of her fondness for henry i told them that you were of all human creatures the one over whom habit had the most power and novelty least and that the very circumstance of the novelty of crawford's addresses was against him their being so new and so recent was all in their disfavour that you could tolerate nothing that you were not used to and a great deal more to the same purpose to give them a knowledge of your character miss crawford made us laugh by her plans of encouragement for her brother she meant to urge him to persevere in the hope of being loved in time and of having his addresses most kindly received at the end of about uh, ten years happy marriage fanny could with difficulty give the smile that was here asked for 
Her feelings were all in revolt. She feared she had been doing wrong, saying too much, overacting the caution which she had been fancying necessary, in guarding against one evil, laying herself open to another, and to have Miss Crawford's liveliness repeated to her at such a moment, and on such a subject, was a bitter aggravation. Edmund saw weariness and distress in her face, and immediately resolved to forbear all farther discussion, and not even to mention the name of Crawford again, except as it might be connected with what must be agreeable to her. On this principle he soon afterwards observed, "'They go on Monday. You are sure, therefore, of seeing your friend either to-morrow or Sunday. They rarely go on Monday, and I was within a trifle of being persuaded to stay at Lessingby till that very day. I had almost promised it. What a difference it might have made! Those five or six days more at Lessingby might have been felt all my life. You were near staying there? Very. I was most kindly pressed, and had nearly consented. Had I received any letter from Mansfield to tell me how you were all going on, I believe I should certainly have stayed. But I knew nothing that had happened here for a fortnight, and felt that I had been away long enough. You spent your time pleasantly there? Yes. That is, it was the fault of my own mind if I did not. They were all very pleasant. I doubt their finding me so. I took uneasiness with me, and there was no getting rid of it till I was in Mansfield again. The Miss Owens. You liked them, did not you? Yes, very well. Pleasant, good-humoured, unaffected girls. But I am spoiled, Fanny, for common female society. Good-humoured, unaffected girls will not do for a man who has been used to sensible women. They are two distinct orders of being. You and Miss Crawford have made me too nice. Still, however, Fanny was oppressed and wearied. He saw it in her looks. It could not be talked away, and attempting it no more, he led her directly, with the kind authority of a privileged guardian, into the house. End of chapter 35of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Edmund now believed himself perfectly acquainted with all that Fanny could tell, or could leave to be conjectured of her sentiments, and he was satisfied. It had been, as he before presumed, too hasty a measure on Crawford's side, and time must be given to make the idea first familiar, and then agreeable to her. She must be used to the consideration of his being in love with her, and then a return of affection might not be very distant. He gave this opinion as the result of the conversation to his father, and recommended there being nothing more said to her, no farther attempts to influence or persuade, but that everything should be left to Crawford's assiduities and the natural workings of her own mind. Sir Thomas promised that it would be so. Edmund's account of Fanny's disposition he could believe to be just. He supposed she had all those feelings, but he must consider it as very unfortunate that she had, for less willing than his son to trust to the future, he could not help fearing that if such very long allowances of time and habit were necessary for her, she might not have persuaded herself into receiving his addresses properly before the young man's inclination for paying them were over. There was nothing to be done, however, but to submit quietly and hope the best. The promised visit from her friend, as Edmund called Miss Crawford, was a formidable threat to Fanny and she lived in continual terror of it. As a sister, so partial and so angry, and so little scrupulous of what she said, and in another light so triumphant and secure, she was in every way an object of painful alarm. Her displeasure, her penetration, and her happiness were all fearful to encounter, and the dependence of having others present when they met was Fanny's only support in looking forward to it. She absented herself as little as possible from Lady Bertram, kept away from the east room, and took no solitary walk in the shrubbery, in her caution to avoid any sudden attack. She succeeded. She was safe in the breakfast-room with her aunt when Miss Crawford did come, and the first misery over, and Miss Crawford looking and speaking with much less particularity of expression than she had anticipated, Fanny began to hope there would be nothing worse to be endured than a half-hour of moderate agitation. But here she hoped too much. Miss Crawford was not the slave of opportunity. She was determined to see Fanny alone, 
and therefore said to her tolerably soon, in a low voice, "'I must speak to you for a few minutes somewhere.' Words that Fanny felt all over her, in all her pulses and all her nerves. Denial was impossible. Her habits of ready submission, on the contrary, made her almost instantly rise and lead the way out of the room. She did it with wretched feelings, but it was inevitable. They were no sooner in the hall than all restraint of countenance was over on Miss Crawford's side. She immediately shook her head at Fanny with arch, yet affectionate reproach, and taking her hand, seemed hardly able to help beginning directly. She said nothing, however, but, "'Sad, sad girl! I do not know when I shall have done scolding you,' and had discretion enough to reserve the rest till they might be secure of having four walls to themselves. Fanny naturally turned upstairs and took her guest to the apartment which was now always fit for comfortable use, opening the door, however, with a most aching heart, and feeling that she had a more distressing scene before her than ever that spot had yet witnessed. But the evil ready to burst on her was at least delayed by the sudden change in Miss Crawford's ideas, by the strong effect on her mind which the finding herself in the East Room again produced. Ha! Ah, she cried with instant animation. Am I here again? the East Room. Only once was I in this room before." And after stopping to look about her, and seemingly to retrace all that had then passed, she added, "'Only once before. Do you remember it? I came to rehearse. Your cousin came too, and we had a rehearsal. You were our audience and prompter. A delightful rehearsal. I shall never forget it. Here we were, just in this part of the room. Here was your cousin, here was I. Here were the chairs. Oh, why will such things never pass away?" Happily for her companion she wanted no answer. Her mind was entirely self-engrossed. She was in a reverie of sweet remembrances. The scene we were rehearsing was so very remarkable, the subject of it so very—very—what shall I say? He was to be describing and recommending matrimony to me. I think I see him now, trying to be as demure and composed as Anhalt ought, through the two long speeches. When two sympathetic hearts meet in the marriage state, matrimony may be called a happy life. I suppose no time can ever wear out the impression I have of his looks and voice as he said those words. It was curious, very curious, that we should have such a scene to play. If I had the power of recalling any one week of my existence, it should be that week that acting week. Say what you would, Fanny, it should be that, for I never knew such exquisite happiness in any other. His sturdy spirit to bend as it did! Oh, it was sweet beyond expression! But alas, that very evening destroyed it all! That very evening brought your most unwelcome uncle! Poor Sir Thomas, who is glad to see you! Yet, Fanny, do not imagine I would now speak disrespectfully of Sir Thomas though I certainly did hate him for many a week. No, I do him justice now. He is just what the head of such a family ought to be. Nay, in sober sadness, I believe I now love you all." And having said so, with a degree of tenderness and consciousness which Fanny had never seen in her before, and now thought only too becoming, she turned away for a moment to recover herself. "'I have had a little fit since I came into this room, as you may perceive,' said she presently with a playful smile. But it is over now, so let us sit down and be comfortable. For as to scolding you, Fanny, which I came fully intending to do, I have not the heart for it when it comes to the point." And embracing her very affectionately, "'Good, gentle Fanny, when I think of this being the last time of seeing you, for I do not know how long, I feel it quite impossible to do anything but love you." Fanny was affected. She had not foreseen anything of this and her feelings could seldom withstand the melancholy influence of the word last. She cried as if she had loved Miss Crawford more than she possibly could, and Miss Crawford, yet farther softened by the sight of such emotion, hung about her with fondness and said, "'I hate to leave you. I shall see no one half so amiable where I am going. Who says we shall not be sisters? I know we shall. I feel that we are born to be connected and those tears convince me that you feel it too, dear Fanny." Fanny roused herself, and replying only in part, said, "'But you are only going from one set of friends to another. You are going to a very particular friend.' "'Yes, very true. 
Mrs. Fraser has been my intimate friend for years, but I have not the least inclination to go near her. I can think only of the friends I am leaving, my excellent sister, yourself, and the Bertrams in general. You have all so much more heart among you than one finds in the world at large. You all give me a feeling of being able to trust and confide in you, which in common intercourse one knows nothing of. I wish I had settled with Mrs. Fraser not to go to her till after Easter, a much better time for the visit. But now I cannot put her off. And when I have done with her I must go to her sister, Lady Stornaway, because she was rather my most particular friend of the two. But I have not cared much for her these three years." After this speech the two girls sat many minutes silent, each thoughtful, Fanny meditating on the different sorts of friendship in the world, Mary on something of less philosophic tendency. She first spoke again. "'How perfectly I remember my resolving to look for you upstairs, and setting off to find my way to the East Room, without having an idea whereabouts it was. How well I remember what I was thinking of as I came along, and my looking in and seeing you sitting here at this table at work, and then your cousin's astonishment when he opened the door at seeing me here. To be sure your uncle's returning that very evening, there never was anything quite like it." Another short fit of abstraction followed, when, shaking it off, she thus attacked her companion. "'Why, Fanny, you are absolutely in a reverie. Thinking, I hope, of one who is always thinking of you. Oh, that I could transport you for a short time into our circle in town, that you might understand how your power over Henry is thought of there. Oh, the envyings and heart-burnings of dozens and dozens! The wonder, the incredulity that will be felt at hearing what you have done! For as to secrecy, Henry is quite the hero of an old romance, and glories in his chains. You should come to London to know how to estimate your conquest. If you were to see how he is so courted, and how I am courted for his sake! Now I am well aware that I shall not be half so welcome to Mrs. Fraser in consequence of his situation with you. When she comes to know the truth, she will very likely wish me in Northamptonshire again, for there is a daughter of Mr. Fraser by a first wife whom she is wild to get married, and wants Henry to take. Oh, she has been trying for him to such a degree! Innocent and quiet as you sit here, you cannot have an idea of the sensation that you will be occasioning, of the curiosity there will be to see you, of the endless questions I shall have to answer. Poor Margaret Fraser will be at me for ever about your eyes and your teeth, and how you do your hair, and who makes your shoes. I wish Margaret were married, for my poor friend's sake, for I look upon the Frasers to be about as unhappy as most other married people. And yet it was a most desirable match for Janet at the time. We were all delighted. She could not do otherwise than accept him, for he was rich and she had nothing. But he turns out ill-tempered and exigeant and wants a young woman, a beautiful young woman of five and twenty, to be as steady as himself. And my friend does not manage him well. She does not seem to know how to make the best of it. There is a spirit of irritation which, to say nothing worse, is certainly very ill-bred. In their house I shall call to mind the conjugal manners of Mansfield Parsonage with respect. Even Dr. Grant does show a thorough confidence in my sister, and a certain consideration for her judgment which makes one feel there is attachment. But of that I shall see nothing with the Frasers. I shall be at Mansfield for ever, Fanny. My own sister is a wife, Sir Thomas Bertram as a husband, are my standards of perfection. Poor Janet has been sadly taken in. And yet there was nothing improper on her side. She did not run into the match inconsiderately. There was no want of foresight. She took three days to consider of his proposals, and during those three days asked the advice of everybody connected with her whose opinion was worth having, and especially applied to my late dear aunt, whose knowledge of the world made her judgment very generally and deservedly looked up to by all the young people of her acquaintance, and she was decidedly in favour of Mr. Fraser. This seems as if nothing were a security for matrimonial comfort. I have not so much to say for my friend Flora who jilted a very nice young man in the blues for the sake of that horrid Lord Stornaway, who has about as much sense, Fanny, as Mr. Rushworth, but much worse-looking, and with a blackguard character. I had my doubts at the time about her being right, for he has not even the air of a gentleman, and now I am sure she was wrong. By the by, Flora Ross was dying for Henry the first winter she came out. 
but were I to attempt to tell you of all the women whom I have known to be in love with him, I should never have done. It is you, only you, insensible Fanny, who can think of him with anything like indifference. But are you so insensible as you profess yourself? No, no, I see you are not. There was, indeed, so deep a blush over Fanny's face at that moment as might warrant strong suspicion in a predisposed mind. Excellent creature! I will not tease you. Everything shall take its course. But, dear Fanny, you must allow that you were not so absolutely unprepared to have the question asked as your cousin fancies. It is not possible but that you must have had some thoughts on the subject, some surmises as to what might be. You must have seen that he was trying to please you by every attention in his power. Was he not devoted to you at the ball? And then before the ball, the necklace. Oh, you received it just as it was meant. You were as conscious as heart could desire. I remember it perfectly. Do you mean, then, that your brother knew of the necklace beforehand? Oh, Miss Crawford, that was not fair. Knew of it? It was his own doing entirely, his own thought. I am ashamed to say that it had never entered my head, but I was delighted to act on his proposal for both your sakes. I will not say, replied Fanny, that I was not half afraid at the time of its being so, for there was something in your look that frightened me, but not at first. I was as unsuspicious of it at first. Indeed, indeed I was. It is as true as that I sit here. And, had I had an idea of it, nothing should have induced me to accept the necklace. As to your brother's behaviour, certainly I was sensible of a particularity. I had been sensible of it some little time, perhaps two or three weeks. But then I considered it as meaning nothing. I put it down as simply being his way, and was as far from supposing as from wishing him to have any serious thoughts of me. I had not, Miss Crawford, been an inattentive observer of what was passing between him and some part of this family in the summer and autumn. I was quiet, but I was not blind. I could not but see that Mr. Crawford allowed himself in gallantries which did me nothing. Ah, I cannot deny it. He has now and then been a sad flirt, and cared very little for the havoc he might be making in young ladies' affections. I have often scolded him for it. But it is his only fault. And there is this to be said, that very few young ladies have any affections worth caring for. And then, Fanny, the glory of fixing one who has been shot at by so many, of having it in one's power to pay off the debts of one's sex. Oh, I am sure it is not in woman's nature to refuse such a triumph." Fanny shook her head. "'I cannot think well of a man who sports with any woman's feelings, and there may often be a great deal more suffered than a stander-by can judge of." "'I do not defend him. I leave him entirely to your mercy and when he has got you at Everingham, I do not care how much you lecture him. But this I will say, that his fault, the liking to make girls a little in love with him, is not half so dangerous to a wife's happiness as a tendency to fall in love himself, which he has never been addicted to. And I do seriously and truly believe that he is attached to you, in a way that he never was to any woman before, that he loves you with all his heart, and will love you as nearly for ever as possible. If any man ever loved a woman for ever, I think Henry will do as much for you." Fanny could not avoid a faint smile, but had nothing to say. "'I cannot imagine Henry ever to have been happier,' continued Mary presently, than when he had succeeded in getting your brother's commission. She had made a sure push at Fanny's feelings here. "'Oh, yes, how very, very kind of him!' "'I know he must have exerted himself very much for I know the parties he had to move. The Admiral hates trouble, and scorns asking favours, and there are so many young men's claims to be attended to in the same way, that a friendship and energy, not very determined, is easily put by. What a happy creature William must be! I wish we could see him." Poor Fanny's mind was thrown into the most distressing of all its varieties. The recollection of what had been done for William was always the most powerful disturber of every decision against Mr. Crawford, and she sat thinking deeply of it, till Mary, who had been first watching her complacently, and then musing on something else, suddenly called her attention by saying, "'I should like to sit here talking with you all day, but we must not forget the ladies below. 
and so good-bye, my dear, my amiable, my excellent Fanny. For though we shall nominally part in the breakfast-parlour, I must take leave of you here. And I do take leave, longing for a happy reunion, and trusting that when we meet again it will be under circumstances which may open our hearts to each other, without any remnant or shadow of reserve. A very, very kind embrace, and some agitation of manner, accompanied these words. "'I shall see your cousin in town soon. He talks of being there tolerably soon. And Sir Thomas, I dare say, in the course of the spring. And your eldest cousin, and the Rushworths, and Julia, I am sure of meeting again and again. And all but you. I have two favours to ask, Fanny. One is your correspondence. You must write to me. And the other, that you will often call on Mrs. Grant, and make her amends for my being gone." The first at least of these favours Fanny would rather not have been asked. But it was impossible for her to refuse the correspondence. It was impossible for her even not to accede to it more readily than her own judgment authorised. There was no resisting so much apparent affection. Her disposition was peculiarly calculated to value a fond treatment, and from having hitherto known so little of it, she was the more overcome by Miss Crawford's. Besides, there was gratitude towards her, for having made their tête-à-tête -tête so much less painful than her fears had predicted. It was over, and she had escaped without reproaches, and without detection. Her secret was still her own, and while that was the case, she thought she could resign herself to almost everything. In the evening there was another parting. Henry Crawford came and sat some time with them, and her spirits not being previously in the strongest state, her heart was softened for a while towards him, because he really seemed to feel. Quite unlike his usual self, he scarcely said anything. He was evidently oppressed, and Fanny must grieve for him, though hoping she might never see him again till he were the husband of some other woman. When it came to the moment of parting, he would take her hand, he would not be denied it. He said nothing, however, or nothing that she heard, and when he had left the room, she was better pleased that such a token of friendship had passed. On the morrow the Crawfords were gone. End of chapter 36